Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Kelly. Uh, I'm the Community Relations Program Assistant here at the Rochester Hills Public Library. And I would like to welcome you to this evening's Smart Towns presentation, The Declaration of Independence, The Words Heard Around the World, with guest speaker Dr. John Todd, Professor of Business Law at Rochester University. Uh, at this time, please take a moment to turn off or silence your phones before the presentation gets started. Uh, we will be recording the program. It will be on the Rochester Hills Public Library website for you to view in about two to four weeks. Uh, and beforehand, we'd just like to thank the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library for supporting our programs through their many fundraising efforts. And there's a reminder. Oh, yeah, clap if you don't mind. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and our reminder that their annual uh, wit, Wine, Wit, and Wisdom fundraiser is on April 25th. Uh, tickets are already on sale. Uh, the event will be from 6.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. Includes a buffet, dinner, drinks, and a dessert. And ticket holders may choose two of seven presentations to attend that evening. There will also be a silent auction. Uh, tickets are on sale for $65 for that event. And after April 6th, they will be $75. Uh, registration forms are available at the circulation desk or online at rhpl.org slash friends. Uh, reservations may also be made online at winewitwisdom2020.eventbrite.com. That's a bright spell, B-R-I-T-E. Uh, tickets will be emailed to the attendees. And for more information, please take one of the event sheets located on the table in the back of the room. It's like a little pink flyer. And uh, if you have any comments about tonight's program or have a suggestion for a future program, please feel free to speak to me. I will make sure that gets to the appropriate parties. Um, I had a short speech to introduce our guest, but in our chaos of setting up these chairs, it seems I've misplaced it, uh, so apologies for that. I do all have a provided introduction, uh, as our guest is, deserves a great introduction, so I will say um, that we are here through the Smart Towns uh, program, and that program uh, is led by local educational organizations, uh, much like the Rochester University, for which you will have probably received a flyer for their upcoming partnership dinner. It's their 49th annual. And uh, Smart Town partners like Rochester University, Oakland University, the Rochester Avon Historical Society, Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm, Meadowbrook Hall, and Ascension Providence for Rochester Hospital. Uh, Smart Town partners provide a unique series of programs exploring one theme or topic per year. Lectures are presented by experts in their field of study. And the theme for 2020 is events that change the world. And Today, we have with us, as mentioned previously, a professor of business law from Rochester University here to talk with us about, uh, as many of us probably know, like today, uh, we, many of us probably voted, uh, which that is due in large part <laughs> in, from high up this important document that will be discussed today, uh, the Declaration of Independence. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Todd. Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming. It's a privilege to be here in Smart Town. I feel smarter already. And uh, I've prepared a limerick uh, for tonight, and it goes like this. Many young students become perplexed, and some older folks are likewise vexed when attempting to understand a mystery from an event or fact in history. The solution is simple. It's context. And so before we talk about the history and philosophy of the Great Declaration of Independence, which I promise will come, and indeed we'll even talk about alleged hypocrisy, but we need to start not quite at the beginning, but we need to go back about 1,200 years. So hold on to your seatbelts. On Christmas Day in the year 800 AD, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne King of France. And that really began a thousand year period in history where European countries were governed by monarchs and the Roman Catholic Church. 
I like to summarize it by saying, Western civilization began in Europe under the governance of priests and princes. And that sums it up. Now, in England, in about 1550, so we've already gained six or 800 years, and we will get to 1776, don't worry. <clears throat> There began a Protestant English Reformation where many Englishmen and the foremost group were the Puritans, but there were other groups, and we'd call them generally separatists. And they wanted to separate from the Church of England, which had been installed after one of a couple of Henry VIII's peccadilloes. And so Henry VIII divorced the Roman Church, and at the same time he established the Church of England, and he named himself Defender of the Faith, and it was a likewise similar established state church, meaning that it was the only church in England. Of course, you English majors know the definite article of the. And here's my definition of a state church. In a nation with a state church, members of that church are rewarded by the government and often, sometimes violently, non-members are punished because the church and the king are partners in governing the people. Now, as I said, after Henry VIII with his dispute with Rome, he set up a very similar church, the Church of England, and it was headed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and among other things, it still included a high church liturgy and very strict hierarchy. It was, after all, the Church of England. So these separatists, in about 1550, began reading their Gutenberg Bible, and they decided, like Martin Luther, that there were some things different with the Church of England and its hierarchy. And they began meeting, they began irritating kings. For example, as you know, the pilgrims who landed at Plymouth Rock, they were given a pass out of England by the king because he didn't want any of those Protestant separatists around, and he let them go to the New World. But now we'll get into the uh, more exciting aspects of English history, and I'll talk about three major dates. And by the way, I do have an annotated bibliography at the end. If anybody wants one, uh, they're welcome. And uh, I won't. I've read, uh, and I've got about 10 English authors. Boy, they write long books with long sentences. And uh, I'll highlight what they've said. And the first date that we'll look at is the decade of the 1640s. And in the 1640s, in jolly old England, they had the English Civil War. And it was a very bloody civil war. For example, 200,000 people died, and a greater percentage of the population died than in the First World War. And England played a major role in that war and had a lot of casualties. So this was a very serious war. And the two sides were King Charles I, King Charles I, the Stuart King, who was a strong defender of the divine right of king. And I read a historian, Lacey Baldwin Smith, who isn't it great when you read a book and they agree with you? Well. Lacey Baldwin-Smith agrees with me 
when he interpreted divine right of kings to mean simply, it means the king is always right. And against him were the rebels, mainly led by Puritans, but they were also joined by thousands of unlanded young Englishmen who worked, many in trades and guilds, but they worked with their hands hard. Because, as you know, and by the way, please don't hold this against me, I'm a lawyer, <clears throat> and so I get to do this, I can cite an English law passed in 1540 called the Statute of Wills. And it set up primogeniture, which meant this. It was illegal for a rich landowner to bequeath his land and wealth to his younger children. The only person who could inherit would be the firstborn son. Now, by the way, I was a firstborn son, but I didn't live in England in the 1600s. And what happened then? Of course, you know they had many children. For example, you're all familiar with John and Charles Wesley. Well, they had 18 brothers and sisters. So there were a lot of unlanded Englishmen back then. In the 1600s, 1700s in England, the king owned a lot of land, the church owned a lot of land, and 5% of the Englishmen owned land. And you can do the math. 5% owned land. 95% did not. And so that left a lot of young men and women too who had to live a non-gentrified life and work. And they joined in the rebellion. And there were really three civil wars. And I read a book called The, uh, the Glorious Revolution and the English Civil War. And there were not only battles, but there were political battles and negotiations with Charles I. And among the roundheads, these Englishmen without land, they began a group known as the Levelers. That's E-R-S, <clears throat> not O-R-S. It's not the Venetian blind. And the Levelers began in the tradition of the Puritans who were radical. Remember, the government during this period of time with the monarch and the church. The Puritans began their rebellion against the church. I think the Roundheads were more against the government and the monarch, but they won the war. And the Roundheads started the Levelers, and I've read a whole book, The Putney Army Debates, and we can summarize it with this. Here's the great quote. The poorest he who lives in England hath the same rights as the richest he. Now, I'm sure you noticed that even those radical egalitarian lovelers forgot about the richest and the poorest she. And that will continue to America, as you know. They took over the meeting. And that meeting took place at St. Mary's Church in the Putney part of London in 1647. Two years later, after Charles I continued to maintain that he had a right to be king, given to him by God, and that he wished to continue the hierarchy of the archbishop and also the high church liturgy, they beheaded him. And then for about 40 years, they had some parliaments and some monarchs because they had castles 
and crown jewels, I suppose, and footmen and stuff. And all those guys at Windsor Palace with the hats, they wanted to do something with those guys. But in the next date in English history is 1688-89. Probably happened over the Christmas break. And this is called the Glorious Revolution. And I am an Anglophile, and I love the English, and only the English could call a revolution glorious because it had no casualties. And basically, here's what happened. James II, a Stuart, Charles I's son, and by the way, his mother was uh, Henrietta Maria, the princess of, from France. That's what they did back then. And he felt that the parliament and the people weren't respecting him. By the way, they took away most of his powers. And they disestablished the Church of England. So he took a vacation. He left, went to the continent. And the parliament said, we don't have a king anymore. And there was the question about a dubious child. And uh, but that we won't get into that. Now, so in response, the parliament sent commissioners to Holland, where Prince William and his wife Mary, who actually was a steward, intermarried to the monarchs in Holland, and they said, come to England, quote, to rescue her. So they came. And they were given the offer, be our king and queen. Now that's an offer you can't refuse even before Don Cor Corleone and Luca Brazzi. So they did. And Prince William, now to be King William, of the House of Orange, said to Parliament, we accept the gracious gift of the people and Parliament of England. So give that a minute and think about Charles I and William and Mary. Now, my wife told me that I should not demand that you guys bring blue books and have an essay test. <laughs> but we will have a fill-in-the-blank question, and you all need to answer the question. Here it goes. In the 17th century, that's the 1600s, the people of England blanked and blanked their kings. Want a hint? Five letter words which rhyme and relate to employment law. In the 17th century, the people of England blanked and blanked their kings. Anybody? Hired and fired. Now, here's another one. In the 17th century in England, the people became the blank. Rhymes with moss. Now, by the way, let's, now, you did so well on the fill in the blanks, let's do some true false. True or false? In the 17th century, the people of England became the boss. True. Now, let's think about what else was happening in the 17th century. It was called the English colonies. They began Jamestown, which was a profit company called a joint stock company, in 1604. And remember, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620. And by 1776, 
Two and a half million people lived in those colonies. 90% were from England. And indeed, one half to two thirds were indentured servants. Remember all those roundheads, the poor people who were unlanded, who had no land. They had the American dream. And by the way, all of you adults out there who've been to a real estate closing and bought your first house, you know the American dream is the ownership of owning your own land. And it began in England, where 95% of the people didn't own it. And millions came to the colonies for that reason. Now, of course, there were many who came for religious freedom. However, all of them, even the zealots, came to own their own farm and or business in town. And remember, almost two-thirds were indentured. You've all heard about indentured servants, by the way, I'll give you a little legal. An indenture is a synonym for a contract. And here's what these young English poor people would do. Usually men, but there were some women who did it. They would go down to Plymouth or Liverpool or London, and they would see a ship, and it would have a sign, sailing for America on such date. And they'd talk to the captain, and they would get free passage to the colonies, excuse me, if they signed a contract. And the contract said, the holder of this document will own you for seven years. And when they got to Virginia especially, they usually were auctioned off on the same platform as slaves. Here's a young Englishman, strong. He can do his numbers. What do you offer? And he would be sold, and he would work for seven years. And remember, two-thirds of the American people by 1776 had gone that route. Imagine that. Imagine how desperate you would have to be to walk up to the ship and sign away seven years of your life and take a four-month journey on one of those old sailing ships. And when you got to the New World, you would be then auctioned off. And you would have a master. In fact, when I went to law school a long time ago, the, they still used the term, not employment law, they used Master and servant law. Do we have any lawyers in the audience want to amen that? Now, so now we come to the third date in English history. And it's 1690, one year later. And at that time, a gentleman, a philosopher named John Locke, wrote a little book entitled The Second Treatise on civil government. Uh, we'd, there was a first treatise, but no one ever reads it. Actually, fortunate for you, I read it a long time ago, along with Hobbes and Hume and Rousseau. So I'll summarize. And indeed, I just uh, read a great book by the Natural Law Foundation. And in 1625, a Dutchman, a lawyer, posed this philosophy about the natural law, the state of nature, the social contract, and the right of property. And Grotius, his name was Hugo Grotius, I guess he was gracious Grotius, he posited this. The first and most essential element of justice is the right of private property. Well, a lot of Englishmen bought into that. And John Locke wrote it up in his book, along with 
some other interesting topics, including natural rights, which he glommed onto from the levelers. Remember, the poorest he in England should have the same rights as the richest he, natural rights. And in his little book, <clears throat> it's not contagious. Um, <laughs> it's just a perennial old man sore throat. Um, he also talked about the right of property, which he got from the Dutchman, and then he went on to develop the theme of the right of resistance, which meant, in our terminology, the right of bloody revolution if the king is a tyrant. And he then justified the civil war in England, said it was great, and he justified the glorious revolution. He said it was great. And that was in 1690. And now we have talked about America a little bit. But remember, while the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution were going on, and while the John Locke wrote his treatise, there were Americans here on the East Coast. And they were proud Englishmen. So I'd like our first flag, the one with the stripes. I've got two volunteers. And let me know when the flag is flying. Stephen Jeff. Flying. Now, you will note in the canton, the upper right corner, the Union Jack. And did I say those Americans loved England? I think I said that. That flag flew right up until the Declaration of Independence. And thank you, gentlemen. And in a minute, we'll have another show and tell. Remember John Locke. He justified the right of revolution when the government was tyrannical. But John Locke wrote his book 350 years ago or so, and he didn't say, when the government is a tyrant or oppressive, you have the right of bloody revolution. He didn't say that. He said something else. I had to read that book a long time ago when I was in college. Oh, by the way, we had cars then. Um, but it was a long time ago. And John Locke called that right of revolution euphemistically an appeal to heaven. Gentlemen, let's fly the next flag. And let me know when it's flying. All right. That is the Massachusetts pine tree flag. And note the red letters above, direct from John Locke. That flag really began to fly in 74 and 75. Many militiamen, including the Sons of Liberty from Boston Tea Party fame, used that. Thank you, gentlemen. That's show and tell. Now, so again, these Americans, two-thirds of them, of indentured servants, who after the seven years, by 1776, all half of the white males in the colonies own their own land or business downtown. They had achieved the American dream, and as it went on, more and more did. But remember, 50% is 10 times the degree of ownership as was occurring with their English cousins in, in England. And again, 
the grand union flag with the stripes and the, and the Union Jack and the Canton flew until 1776. And now we will begin to talk about the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> now, in my classes of political science, I've developed what I call Todd's Rule of Politics. And it has a neat application to this uh, particular context of history. It's brief. The definition of politics is the civilized means of resolving competing self-interest through bargaining and compromise. So what is the uncivilized means of resolving competing self-interest, gang? War. That's what the Puritans and Roundheads did. And that's what the Americans were about to do in 76. And what really spawned it <clears throat> was a generation Oh, beginning in the 1755 era, when King George III and Parliament began to crack down on the English colony. The Stamp Act, of course, they had nothing to do with postage stamps, and the requirement of buying tea, when those good Americans who had become great shipbuilders, great sailors, and finally, the ultimate, they were great smugglers, went to the Caribbean and found a new drink, a better drink than tea, of course. You all know it, you all drink it. And when they sent the ship full of tea to America, the brave New Yorkers would not even let it dock. And there wasn't even a rumor of corona disease. <clears throat> The people of Boston let it dock, but you know that they threw the tea overboard. So these were rebels. And they had tried politics. They'd sent Ben Franklin and several other emissaries. Parliament would not talk to them. It was Mother England, and the colonies were the children. And they had duties to pay taxes and buy British goods but they didn't have rights. Okay. Um. Oh, really? Are we okay now? Okay, thank you. Now, Maybe I can hold it. Don't go away. Okay. We're on time. Thank you. Ah. So they tried politics for 10 or 15 years. Then they, in every colony, the leaders would, they really had a chain letter. It was called Committees of Correspondence. And what they did is they told all the other colonies and exchanged these letters complaining about what the Red Coat Army that had been dragooned in their homes. And in 1775, they met in Philadelphia. By the way, read a great book by Joseph Ellis, who's a great American historian. And he talks, says that when Thomas Jefferson arrived in Philadelphia in 1775, 
He arrived with three slaves and four horses and an expensive enclosed carriage. Thomas Jefferson was a rich guy. He did like property. And what they did, really, for about a year was they whined. Not like wine and wisdom, wine with an H. Finally, a brave young man, Richard Henry Lee, on, July, on June 7th, 1776, stood up and said, gentlemen, stop whining. We need to declare independence and fight the British. They all said, right on. And so they passed that resolution on June, July, yeah, June 10th. They appointed a committee of five. Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, two brilliant patriots, and two more, Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and, of course, Thomas Jefferson. At their first meeting... The other four did as many people do in committees. They said, let Tom do it. <laughs> and so he did it. And in about three weeks, he had written the first draft, which included an impassioned, trenchant, philosophical diatribe against slavery. The committee met, they talked about political expediency. Half the states were slave-holding states that wouldn't fly. And Jefferson did have purposes. <clears throat> One of them was to unite the country. In 1776, those colonies, the people, were divided into three groups. The first group wanted revolution, one-third. One-third were Tories, pro-English. The middle third didn't care. So if they were going to fight and win a war against the world's superpower, he needed to rally the troops, and we'll get into that. And so he acquiesced. John Adams called it the most eloquent, brilliant piece of legal philosophy ever written. <clears throat> and remember, Thomas Jefferson wrote, and he used Locke, who called human slavery a tyranny of human nature. Brilliant. Now we'll get to another aspect before we get into the philosophy. Thomas Jefferson was a lawyer. And if you will recall, a long time ago, there was a great movie called The Paper Chase. And the law professor addressed his first year class and he said, you come in here with a skull full of mush. And if you succeed, you will begin to think like a lawyer. And lawyers do think differently, and they analyze differently. And Thomas Jefferson was a lawyer. And he began to write the Declaration as a lawyer would. Several commentators have said that it looked like a bill of particulars, it's translated as an indictment of King George III. And it reads that way. And there is a principle of statutory construction, how to interpret a document. I'll give you the Latin. Expressio unius estus exclusio alterius, meaning if you state one explicitly, it excludes the other. And Thomas Jefferson used that in his writing. Now, he had a preamble, which is basically two lines, which he stated his purposes. First, sever the bonds of allegiance with England, declare independence. 
And then he said, with a decent respect to mankind, we need to explain our reasons. And he said that we would declare independence from England and establish a sovereign nation to take its place according to the laws of nature and nature's God as a nation in the world. And remember, he was talking about natural rights, nature's God, and the laws of nature. He was not talking about the Old and New Testament. Remember, the Englishman first revolted against the church. Now, now we'll get to the philosophy. He begins, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, let's think about that. What he's really saying is this, but of course he wrote it in Jeffersonian poetry. What I'm about to tell you is true and obvious. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What a way to begin an argument. I try that with my wife, but she, she's always out of the room when I begin the preamble. <clears throat> now we get to the controversial part. Again, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now, when he wrote M-E-N, Thomas Jefferson meant males. He was like the levelers. If he had wanted to include women and African slaves, he would have done so. But he wrote men. Now, a couple reasons again. First of all, in 1776, the United States was not the only place with slavery. It, it, it existed everywhere in the world, including England. Number two, he had a point to make. And here is his equation. White American men are equal to that white guy King George III. That's the equality he was talking about. State of nature. When a baby boy is born, he comes into the world with no clothes on, but he has natural rights. And so, the white American men who were born in the state of nature are equal to every other white man, including King George. That is the equality that he was talking about. And so, remember, he was forced to get rid of the uh, paragraphs on condemning slavery. And he wasn't talking about slavery. And as a lawyer, I can tell you, you have a purpose in your argument. His argument was to condemn the king of England and to say that we men in America are equal to him. He wasn't, his purpose did not include establishing rights for women or African slaves. They were irrelevant. And by the way, anybody who watches TV and movies about law shows you know that lawyers have a big deal about relevancy, right? He was being relevant to his purpose. Okay. Okay. I'll finish in a minute. And then we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, 
He did believe in creation and that when a human being was born, much like most religious people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Jews, they, you're born with a soul. That concept was familiar to him. But look on an anatomy chart, you can't find your soul. The same is true with natural rights. You're born, you have rights. And that's what he meant. We're endowed or blessed with natural rights, which include the right to property, the right to revolution. Now, the only legal word that he used was this word unalienable. And here's what it means in the law. As a verb, there is a transitive verb in the English law called to alienate property. And here's what that means. It means to transfer ownership. So when he wrote that our natural rights are unalienable, it meant that you got them and nobody can take them away. They, they can't be bought or sold. Now remember, Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant writer. So if he says we have unalienable rights, that's the only way that can be consistent with the prior prior clause that all men are created equal is if he's talking about it the way I explained. If we were talking about all men, then that would include black men, it would include women maybe, and it would be inconsistent, and there is no inconsistency in this doctrine. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, by the way, that's a lawyer's literary trick. It means I'm going to list three, but we got a lot more. <laughs> that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, John Locke, his trio of natural rights were life, liberty, and property. Eleven years later, when they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they included life, liberty, and property. Remember, Thomas Jefferson owned two mansions, thousands of acres of land. He was a lawyer who went to court to defend his own property rights and the property rights of clients. Thomas Jefferson was not a communist. He loved private property. But he took that word out. Now, many people over the years have speculated on why he did. Here's my take. Two reasons. First of all, pursuit of happiness was a phrase that had been used for many years in the colonies, including George Mason's Virginia Bill of Rights, that he wrote a couple weeks earlier. And he wrote, life, liberty, and the inherent right to pursue happiness and own property. Well, I've read John Locke, and I've read George Mason, and believe me, just read Thomas Jefferson. So that's the first reason. Joseph Ellis, the great American historian, from the great college, Mount Holyoke in Massachusetts, he theorized that one of the other reasons that Jefferson did that was that he wanted to slap those people in the face who made him take out the condemnation of slavery. He didn't want to say it. Now, the final point in the philosophy of the Declaration is this. Remember, and by the way, here's my... Listen again. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Remember, this would be read aloud in town squares. 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and property. It is my theory that Jefferson put pursuit of happiness in place of property as a rhetorical flourish. He was a writer. He was a poet. Now, the final bit of philosophy goes like this. Paraphrase. To secure these rights, or put another way, in order to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men or by men. Now, Thomas Jefferson was also very courageous. The divine right of kings came from the Old and New Testament. And in the epistles of the Romans, the apostle Paul even wrote, governments are instituted by God. Well, Thomas Jefferson was continuing the religious rebellion and he hit it head on. And he said, governments are instituted by men. The enlightenment reason. And then he went on. When a government is destructive of these rights, when they're a tyrant, the people have the right to alter or abolish it. And that's John Locke also. John Locke had an appeal to heaven. Thomas Jefferson, quote, we have a right to change our government or abolish it. Now, he closed with, <clears throat> again, another poetic line, toward these ends, We will devote our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And they did so. Many were killed in prison. Many of their properties were burned and destroyed by the British. Now, I think we have a minute for any comments or questions. And got to talk loud. I'm... And who are, who are you, man? Ah. Here's my theory of the Civil War. It'll be quick. When they wrote the Constitution, they wrote the three fifths clause. The northern men wanted slaves to count zero because it would give the South extra power. The South wanted to count them as one whole white person, but they compromised on three-fifths. My theory is this. If they had demanded that the slaves count, oh, and then, by the way, after the Constitution was written, one-third, two-thirds of every president, every speaker of the House, and every member of the U.S. Supreme Court were Southern slaveholders. That slave extra bonus gave the South power. So, if they had said the slaves counted three-fourths, the, the Civil War would have come a decade earlier. If they'd said uh, that they would count less, it would have been later. But the Civil War was going to come. Jefferson knew that. Poetically, he said that slavery for America was like holding the ears of a large wolf. And so he knew it was coming. And I don't, I think if they put it in, they needed all the states to fight that war and they wouldn't have come along. So I hope that answers you. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much.
And if uh, anybody wants to come and shake hands or bump fists, say hello. And I've got a, the annotated bibliography if anyone reads books. So.